Good morning. Welcome to the Northern Design Centre. Welcome to the fourth Design Means Business Conference, an annual celebration of design and the power of design really to transform businesses. Uh, my name is Terry McStay and I'm going to be on your host for the day. Um, and I have the great pleasure of representing one of the co-hosting organisations uh, for today's conference, um, Design Network North, which is a, a community really of about 500 organisations and individuals across the north of England who are, who are passionate about design, who see the value of design in most things that they do. Um, the other co-host for today is uh, Northumbria University, in particular the, the School of Design, one of the top design schools in the country, if not the world, um, and boasting many illustrious alumni, many of whom are represented on our speaking programme today. Um, as you can see from the, the logo heavy slide, the event is also part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Disruptive Innovation Festival, which is a, a global festival of events happening around the world, it being a global festival, uh, that have been going on for the last three weeks, um, and which are all about um, exploring this, the idea of the circular economy. Uh, the conference is being live streamed over the web, um, so to those of you watching online, good morning, or good evening indeed from wherever you are. Um, we hope you enjoy being part of the conference as much as we're going to enjoy it today. <coughs> Um, so really today is an opportunity to be, to be inspired, to learn new things, to meet new people. Um, but really most importantly I think to take something away. Something that will change the way you do business, something that will change the way you do design within your business. That's really what this conference is all about. We firmly believe, as I'm sure most of you do, that design is a powerful concept, a powerful skill and it can make a real difference. And that's what we're here to, to celebrate and or to, to learn a bit more about. Um, so before we get down to business, the two host organisations would like to welcome you to the conference. Um, Gordon Olivier, who's the CEO of RTC North, um, which is the company that runs Design Network North, sadly can't be with us uh, this morning. He sends his apologies and he's asked me to say a few words on his behalf. So I shall don my RTC North hat. And um, RTC North is celebrating its, its 25th anniversary this year. Um, 25 years of helping businesses across the north of England to, to grow, develop, flourish, um, not just through design, but by helping them to export, helping them to be more efficient in their manufacturing processes, um, helping them to collaborate and to um, exploit and commercialise new technology. Uh, we're hosting um, a celebration of innovation dinner next week actually, which is partly a celebration of our anniversary, but really it's about showcasing um, some of the companies that we've had the pleasure of working with over those 25 years and some of the things that they've, that they've achieved. Uh, we're presenting five innovation awards, which cover the kind of the five main areas that, that we work in. Um, one of them, the um, Innovation Through Design Award, which has actually been kindly sponsored by Northumbria University. The nine or 10 nominations for that award do in some ways represent the breadth of design and design projects that we've been involved in over the last few years. Uh, one example, uh, Sleeper Dome, which was about a year ago, was a, a derelict former print shop in Newcastle. Um, it was bought by the owner of the Best Western Hotel on Westgate Road, who intended to turn it into a, a backpacker uh, hostel. Um, and rather than just kind of giving it a lick of paint and putting a few bunks in, he, um, he worked with a, a talented designer to create something that was well thought out, well designed, with great attention to detail. Um, and to the extent that he's now decided to convert his existing hotel to the same format and to have it under the same brand, um, and is actually looking for other properties in, in Edinburgh and a few other cities to, to transform also. Um, so what could have been a, a, a very simple build, building renovation has actually turned into the creation of a whole new product, a whole new brand with huge potential. And that just came through working with a great designer to develop and produce a great end product. At, at the other end of the scale, um, Suckerfish were based in North Shields on the Fish Key, appropriately enough. Um, they have designed and developed a monitoring device which attaches to fishing nets so that when um, the trawler is at sea, it's collecting data from, uh, from the seabed on sea temperature, salinity, density, 
and that's transmitted in real time to the Met Office who use it to improve their um, weather forecasts in some ways for the benefit of those fishermen themselves. Um, and our teaching is very proud to have been able to work with these companies and many other companies um, through Design Network North and through the other programs that we run. Um, we're very proud to be supporting this conference again and we very much hope that you enjoy the day. Thank you, Gordon. Um, <laughs> and now I'd like to invite uh, from Northam University, uh, Trevor Duncan, who's head of the School of Design, to also welcome you to today's event. Uh, thanks, Terry. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit odd, I suppose, welcoming you after someone else has welcomed you, but I did really want to make a point or two from why we're engaged with this event from the School of Design's perspective. We're really delighted to be co-hosting the event um, today, um, and especially given the nature and the quality of the speakers that you've got presenting to you. A great number of these speakers are, are long-term friends <coughs> of the School of Design. Um, some of them studied at the school, some of them studied in my time, some of them studied before I even started at the university, if that's imaginable, given the state of me. Um, <coughs> and these days are, are really important because it gives us a chance to pause and think a little bit about the impact of design. Often we're just wrapped up in doing design, teaching design, learning design. Um, but I look back at my career at Northumbria, and I've been there more than 15 years now, since I started the same day as Mark, or the day after. Uh, it was, a, it was an auspicious day for the institution, <laughs> if, if not for our colleagues. Um, but when I look back, I started thinking I'd probably be here, connected with the school for two or three years and move on to another, another activity. Um, that time's flown, and when I think why I've stuck with it, I suppose I anticipated moving into education consultancy, that it would be as I anticipated. You would be in part of a cycle, um, travelling through educating students, and then restarting that cycle. Actually, what I found at, at Northumbria very much mirrors design in industry. It's never the same. We've never had a similar year, even. Whether that's structure, whether that's reacting to content, whatever it is, it's been a complete roller coaster, often nightmare, of change. <laughs> Looking back, I embrace change. At the time, I'm often struggling to cope with it. Um, and I think that goes for most of us. Um, I suppose what, what makes that chain insistent and consistent is at Northumbria, and it's particular to Northumbria School of Design, is our connection with outside agencies, partners, and industry. Um, we embrace that. It's very much what the, the credo of the school is about across all of its discipline areas. Um, the speakers that you, you're going to, to hear today, many of them have collaborated with the school over a number of years. Um, and that's because they see real value in continuing that debate. Um, why we value it is, it would be all too easy to fall into the trap of being simply a training school for the profession. When we work with our partners, they often provoke and push us to venture into new territories, whether that's defining new discipline areas, working with different approaches, innovating. It does force us to really reflect what we deliver to students and make sure that they have currency, as well as the skills and attributes that consultancy requires. Um, The NDC, or Northern Design Centre, is a, is, a, is a beacon, really. Um, and in many ways, and I'd always say it, um, because I'm biased, the design school has uh, a venturing approach. We're the first to occupy this building in any real, tangible sense. Um, and others usually follow. Um, we see the Northern Design Centre as an opportunity to really reinforce and take our collaboration to new levels. Um, the work that we're venturing with, with Unilever, with Mars, with a number of regional partners, proves the value of this type of approach. We don't teach in this building. Um, we don't do consultancy work out of this building. We collaborate with partners, both regional, national, and international. Um, we see the future of that being a cross-faculty arrangement, where we bring other faculties to, to, into, into projects with partners. Um, we're doing work with life sciences, sports sciences, um, across a number of areas. I'm not going to hog the stage any longer because I've heard on the grapevine that some nuggets of gold that Mark's going to <laughs> impart to you, whereas Richard's got even better stuff, apparently. Um, the speakers know each other. They're, they're fiercely competitive, um, hugely engaging, 
and, and very imaginative. Finally, I would just like to express our gratitude to all of our speakers, to our alumni, to our regional partners, to students, for taking the time, making the effort to attend, and perhaps most importantly, paying the fee. Um, I hope you have a really engaging day. Um, and I'll hand over to Paul Howes, who's Senior VP of Packaging at Unilever. <coughs> waiting for my IT assistant. <laughs> Thank you very much. While we're dealing with the technology, actually there's a couple of um, housekeeping things I need to go through. Um, there aren't any fire alarm tests planned today, so if you do hear something that sounds like a fire alarm, it'll be the real thing. So follow me through that door, out to reception where you came in, where like, and then if you go to the right, out of the main entrance, that's where we'll all congregate and wait for the fire brigade to arrive. Obviously we hope that doesn't happen. Uh, the facilities, should you need them, um, if, again, if you go out to reception and turn left towards the stairs, uh, the gents are on the left and the ladies are on the right. If there's a queue, the same pattern is repeated on all floors, so do feel free to go up the stairs if you, if you need to. Um, and what, I'd ask you to put your mobiles on the silent, please, if you wouldn't mind. There is always one, and you don't want to be that one. Um, but what, I would invite you and encourage you to tweet, if that's your thing. Um, hashtag design means business. Um, and also to those watching us online, We'd love to see some tweets from the other side of the world, so please do join in if you're able. Um, now, it's not very often that I can introduce a speaker uh, <coughs> safe in the knowledge that everyone in the room will have um, used or consumed one of their products, certainly in the last week, quite possibly even that day. Um, last night, in preparation for this, I was tucking into a tub of Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Um, fish food is my current favorite, and I'm trying to work my way through the range while my daughter was slapping Helen's mayonnaise on her chicken sandwiches for her lunch today. And they're just two of 400 or so brands that Unilever uh, looks after. And within that, tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of indiv individual products. All of which come in jars, bottles, boxes, packets. Um, and managing that packaging is an immense challenge and Unilever has set itself an even greater challenge of how to um, tackle that over the next few years. And I'm very pleased to welcome, welcome Paul Howells to tell us a little bit about how they're going to tackle that challenge. Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. So, um, yes, everybody, my name's Paul. Um, first bit of disappointing news is uh, I'm not an SVP, I'm just a VP. So uh, I essentially look after packaging for Unilever. And uh, I was reflecting uh, when I was looking out the window, looking at St. James's Park, that um, when I took the, uh, the invite, I thought that's going to be wonderful because it's going to be two oh. weeks after Liverpool would have beaten Newcastle, given the, <laughs> the state of Newcastle Football Club, we say no more about that. Anyway, um, I was asked to sort of uh, talk about um, the sort of uh, theme of packaging and, and responsibility. So I've taken the liberty of tweaking the title, as you can see, and I'm just going to talk about design means responsible business. So the things I'm going to cover um, are uh, a little bit about who Unilever are. Um, see how many times that you can uh, recognize the brands. Uh, then I'm gonna sort of tee up the discussion um, around <coughs> what we call the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. I'll then talk about the exciting subject of packaging waste. I promise you it'll be exciting. Uh, and then, more importantly, let's bring it to life with a couple of case studies, which will show you uh, some of the work that we do um, and the sort of work that we're partnering uh, at the MacArthur Foundation and Northumbria and others. So uh, we'll kick off with uh, who is Unilever. Um, so essentially, it's an organization which <coughs> consists, as uh, we've already said, of, of, of lots of brands, many that you'll know, uh, many that you won't know. Often I get surprised about something that I'm using and find a little Unilever logo on the back. Um, but essentially, the organization is uh, uh, split across four big categories, and you can see them on the screen. And some of the sort of Factoids, uh, we've already said 400 brands, um, 150 million purchases a day, and the sort of big number that uh, we were chatting about earlier is um, used 2 billion times a, a day. Um, pretty much resident everywhere, uh, and uh, uh, truly a, a global organization. Um, so, that's who we are. Um, now let's get into this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. So, um, first of all, we, we'll sort of talk about um, Unilever's strategy in this place, and it, and it starts with something called the compass. 
and um, you'll see this on the website, you can see the vision here, but essentially what it's saying is um, over the period 2010, 20 to 2020, our ambition is to double the size of the business, and then the tricky bit is but to half our environmental impact, okay? So that really is the, the challenge for, for us uh, as a business, and um, it sort of means that um, it's fine doing some sort of relatively incremental things, but actually until you do something that we might call game-changing, you haven't got a hope in hell of ever achieving this. And that's really the theme of, of, the, of the talk today. Now this uh, compass strategy then sort of drops down into a, 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 a whole series of activities. But one thing I just wanted to show you, which is a sort of hot off the press, is that um, there's a, a, an index called the Dow, Jane, Dow Jones Sustainability Index. You might be familiar with it. And I'm proud to say that uh, in the latest uh, assessment, and, it, and we get measured across all uh, uh, range of indices, we've just sort of come top of the um, uh, uh, in the index in FMCG, which is something we're very proud of. Uh, and I think hopefully today you'll get a feel for you know, how we manage to achieve that. Anyway, we're talking about the company strategy, which then feeds this thing called the USLP. So it means Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. And really it has these three areas of focus that, uh, that really drive all aspects of the business. You can see that it's all about health and well-being, even when it comes to eating Magnum ice creams, there's a theme there as well. Um, it's about reducing the environmental impact, and of course, a key <coughs> one is about enhancing livelihoods. Okay? Now, that's all fine in terms of a sort of high-level aspiration, but how does it sort of happen in reality? Well, basically, we break that down, and hopefully you can see that at the back of the room. We break it down into nine areas that we're going to work on in Unilever and have been working on over the last uh, five years or so. You can see here that you've got everything from um, opportunities for women uh, through to water, health and <coughs> hygiene, nutrition, etc., etc. And every single one of these uh, strategic initiatives has uh, a leadership team in place and it permeates all the way through the business. Now the good news is today, I'm not going to talk about the nine, because we'll be here forever. I'm just going to talk about a couple of them which are in my field of responsibility, which is to do with the theme of packaging. Okay? So waste and packaging and uh, greenhouse gas. Okay? Uh, well, greenhouse gas as it extends to uh, the manufacture and supply of packaging. There are other aspects of greenhouse gas which, of course, relate to manufacturing operations. But these are the areas that Unilever, in addition to innovating new products, is focusing on. Okay? <coughs> So that's really the, the, the sort of Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. If you want to know more information, um, just go in to, just Google USLP and you'll find a whole series of details, <coughs> projects, how we're organised, the reporting, anything you might want to know, it's all there on the web. So, let's talk about my area, which is this packaging waste. Um, so, we're going to start here with the strategy, okay? Now traditionally, um, our strategy would, would focus on what we might call the sort of four R's or three R's, depending on how you want to count them, um, and you'll be very familiar with those. <coughs> but increasingly, our new focus is on this whole subject of what we call rethink, okay? This idea of, remember I said, you know, we can, we can make some difference by, by tweaking and twiddling and shaving bits off, but actually, until you start to rethink, you're really not going to reduce your packaging by the order of magnitude that we saw on the compass target, namely around about 50%. And the way we're moving this rethink agenda forward is through a number of strategic partnerships. And I've presented to Northern Rugby before, and I promised them that this isn't a chart made up for the occasion, and it isn't made up for today's occasion either. This is essentially our chart which says this is the agenda that we're driving in Rethink. So strategic partnerships with Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we're a very, very close partner. We meet with the team regularly, we meet with Ellen regularly, we have a look at what we could be doing more to drive this agenda. And crucially, um, working with Northumbria, 
both in respect to the School of Design, but with Raymond Oliver in the whole sort of advanced technology of materials. And I'm going to say more about that a little bit later. And I'm scanning the room to find Raymond, but I can't see him, so maybe he's a bit late. But uh, anyway, we'll talk to him later. So basically, this is our, our strategy uh, at the high level. However, a strategy is fine, but it actually you've got to make it happen. So our focus in terms of landing this strategy is, is associated or basically built upon these uh, four areas, I'm moving so that people over there can see a bit, these four areas which are, as we can see, design for circular, <clears throat> transforming markets, game-changing technology, and probably more conventionally, the whole area of recovery and recycling. Um, and this is the topic, really, of, of today's conversation, and we're going to look at some of the case studies. But the transforming market point, which is maybe the one that is a little bit um, uh, unclear, what is he talking about? The idea here is that you know, Unilever is a massive organisation, and we've seen that from the intro. And uh, our philosophy is that through our scale, um, you know, not only we, can we improve, obviously, Unilever's contribution, but we can help shape a fundamental change in, in the whole industry. Um, our sort of chief sustainability officer has a really nice phrase which says, uh, our objective is to uh, reduce our footprint and increase our handprint. Yeah, that's the sort of philosophy that, uh, that, we, that we talk about. So this is the strategy. Um, so now let's talk about um, a couple of case studies that hopefully will give you a little bit of an insight into uh, how, we, uh, how we make this happen. So, um, I'm pausing for a quick slur. So first um, case study, we're going to talk about this one. Okay, so uh, this, is, um, this is this, okay. And uh, just to make this uh, a little bit more um, understandable or interesting, hopefully <coughs> we've got a little video here which will uh, show you a bit about it. There's a big change happening in the deodorant tile. We've compressed our big cans into little ones. At Shaw, Dove and Vaseline, we've put our heads together to make our aerosols more environmentally friendly. Because little cans mean less waste. We've found a way to compress the same amount of protection into a little can half the size. Use them just like normal and they will last just as long and work just as well. Or we'll give you your money back. New compressed deodorants. Look for the little cans with the green band. Okay, so um, we'll talk about how did we make that happen because uh, it was not particularly easy. Anyway, recipe for success. Three things. Um, first of all, I'm going to say you cannot just go out there and say we're going to save the world by making deodorants uh, compressed because that really doesn't turn on that many people. There are some people who are attracted by it, but it's not the big news. For us, it's about game-changing technology. So um, basically getting the same amount of uh, product delivered in a smaller pack was quite challenging. Okay? And uh, just to give you a sort of feel for that, um, one of the key challenges related to something I'll talk about later when we touch on marketing, but it was about the value um, proposition to consumers. So you can imagine that um, if Unilever comes along and says, guys, by the way, um, we're going to just compress your deodorants and we're going to charge you the same money, uh, you know, people might be a little bit sceptical. Certainly people in Yorkshire would be sceptical and say, you know, you're, you're sort of trying to rip us off, you know, that because, you know, you're just basically trying to um, charge us more uh, for essentially the same thing. So the whole proposition had to be based around this thing will give you exactly, and I mean exactly, the same amount of um, efficacy, the same amount of doses, uh, the same amount of use that you will get from the big one. Okay? Now, that's a claim that basically you'll see later we uh, attached a or you get your money back guarantee to. But interestingly enough, that presented a massive technical challenge. And why? Because, honestly, before we introduce compressed, um, whether this can of what we call dilute deodorant lasted um, 
90 days, 91 days, 81, 88 days, we weren't really that bothered because it, it basically, you know, nobody was comparing it to a baseline or a benchmark. Once we said this will last as long as this, we knew that we had to guarantee that. And the manufacturing controls, um, both within our facilities and within our suppliers' facilities, had to be tightened tremendously in order to always deliver exactly the same amount of product every single time. Uh, otherwise, we would have been susceptible to uh, accusations that actually it was, it was a scam. So I'll talk more about that later, but the technology that's in here to bring that to life and to make it happen is quite challenging. Now, the second topic, uh, uh, which is highly relevant to today, is this sort of theme of great design. Um, we had to make sure that the thing was going to look good uh, as well as uh, deliver the value. And one of the tricky things that we were faced with um, when we were developing Compressed is it, that it was exactly at the same time that we were refreshing the what we call dilute range with new hardware. So, for example, in this product, which is uh, sure for men, we were changing the uh, design. We were coming up with this very um, uh, sexy sort of what we call an actuator, which is for guys. So it has like a red thing in the middle, which is supposed to cue a, a brake disc on a, on a Ferrari or a Porsche. It even has a bit on the top here, which is supposed to be a rubber tire. It has a clip <coughs> down. All the things that people who are into design would appreciate. And we were developing this. We were developing this for, for the dilute range, and then you know, the business came along and said, "No, you've got to make it smaller for them." We said, "Oh my God." We can't, we can't develop two of these because if we launch Compress, we're not really sure how it's going to go. So, you know, how do you sort of hedge your bets? So the point here is that when we're designing for the conventional range, we also had to make sure that we could accommodate the Compress range and be flexible in terms of, you know, can diameters, the way we're going to fit the can, etc., to the valve and actuator. So it was quite tricky. Um, so that was the, uh, the product that um, is for um, uh, sure. You might be familiar with a, another Unilever deodorant product, which is for guys, which is uh, for links or, or Axe if you're in Europe. And again, this is completely new hardware. Notice that this is, this is fatter, fatter than this one, and that's because the diameter has to be the same size as the conventional pack so that we can flex according to what the sales volumes go from in terms of dilute to concentrate. We need to sort of have that agility. So it was quite tricky. Um, I remember, you know, my guys were sort of in charge of the design of these two innovations and, and we were sort of thinking that it was going to be fairly straightforward and then the business said, oh, by the way, you have to also develop a compressed range as well. And it was quite a, quite, a, quite a tough one. And, you know, in terms of giving you an idea of scale, um, you know, Unilever will sell globally about one billion of these, yeah? So uh, managing the sort of design and rollout of that amount, but not just in one format, but in two formats, was quite a challenge. And last but not least, and honestly, for me, the biggest challenge was associated with marketing. <coughs> Remember I'm saying that, you know, we've got to find a way of convincing consumers that this is a good deal. And also convincing our colleagues uh, in the trade that it's a good deal. So when I think about talking benefits, for us it was about not just talking sustainability, in fact hardly ever talking sustainability, but talking more about the benefits in other areas. This was the key thing, yeah? And you can see here some of the headlines. And let's just dive into that uh, with a bit more detail. So first of all, good for consumers. I've already shared what we see as the challenge, scepticism and people not sure about the value. So here's a little video of how uh, one of our brands, um, Dove, um, managed to do this. Nine out of ten women who tried the new Dove compressed deodorant loved it. I love it because my underarms feel really smooth. It's just very really soft and quite silky. It feels smooth and soft. It's a lovely feeling, but it also makes my skin feel very moisturised. You've got to say the most, just compressed. New Dove Compressed, our best care ever in a compressed can. This is fantastic. I love it. Nine out of ten women love it. New Dove Compressed. Try it. You'll love it. So, um... The, the key thing here, apart from just the value proposition, was also looking for other benefits. And, and a key one for females particularly 
is the portability aspect. Yeah? You, you're basically compressing it so you can pop it into your handbag, um, and, and people really love that. By the way, on the subject of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, if you've never looked at the Dove campaign for real beauty, which is a massive theme, I'd also encourage you to have a look at that on the website because it really does bring to life that whole sort of self-esteem for women uh, uh, con content that we talked about earlier. Really interesting. Okay, so enough of that. Um, retailers. Retail environment extremely tough, but for us, uh, the key benefit related to um, the opportunity to get more sales per square meter of shelf. Um, so you can basically see some of the sort of uh, figures on the screen. Um, essentially what it meant was that when we approached Boots, Sainsbury's, Carrefour, etc., etc., they were very excited about this because for them it meant they could increase the profitability per square meter of shelf. So you can sort of imagine you're generating some pull from retailers around the proposition as well, which is, which is really important. And of course, the theme of today, what about the environment? Well, you can probably work out that this saves packaging. And you can see here uh, some of the metrics. So half the amount of gas, and this is where we talk about the greenhouse gas metric that we talked about in the beginning, 25% reduction in aluminium per can, and 25% reduction in carbon footprint for an average can. Yeah? So basically, these are the sort of savings that we um, are very uh, proud of. However, you might be sat there thinking, still a long way from 50% pull in terms of packaging saving, and yes it is, so we're gonna have to go even further over the next five years to think about what we can do uh, to take it to the next sort of 25%. But it's a step in the right direction. Transforming markets, you know, I've talked about this. How on earth do you get the, the consumers, and more importantly, the consumers of deodorants everywhere to start to uh, basically be willing to purchase compressed deodorants <coughs> rather than dilute deodorants. Well, you can sort of see, hopefully, and the lighting is a little bit sort of blurred at the front, but you can see some of these sort of campaigns. So in-store campaigns, are particularly like this one, I don't know if you can see it well from the back, but um, very clever to put in store uh, little booze. You know when you go into store and somebody asks you to sort of sample of some whiskey or a biscuit, uh, but this is just sampling the odors, and you can see that it's like miniature Look, the girl sat there, and uh, people are thinking, why is she, you know, in that uh, little booth? It's basically again communicating the whole compressed message. And then the final thing that I'd leave you with on this transforming markets is, is, is a little video uh, about about sort of guys, because guys are sort of you know super cynical. Um, and uh, when we started the uh, campaign for compressed. We started with, with females, and then we thought, right, we're going to roll it out to guys. So I'm just going to show you one more ad, which is this one, which shows you how There's we did it for guys. There's a change happening in the deodorant aisle. We've compressed the big cans into small ones. At Shaw, Dove and Lynx, we've put our heads together to make our aerosols more environmentally friendly, because smaller cans mean less waste. We found a way to compress the same amount of protection into new, smaller cans. Use them just like normal, and they will last just as long and work just as well, or we will give you your money back. New compressed deodorants. Look for the small cans with the green band. Very good. Okay, and finally, just to sort of give you a feel for how it's landed in the marketplace, we've switched now, uh, certainly in European markets where we've lodged compressed, more than 50% into, uh, into this format. And you can see uh, by some of the industry awards on the screen that it's been very well received and um, we're now well on our way to uh, our objective of one day um, moving all uh, deodorants and antiperspirants to this format and then extending it to other, other aerosol formats. So that just gives you hopefully a little feel for uh, the story of um, compressed okay so um, just checking time I think we're okay um, I'm going to now take a, a, a very different um, case study um, which is called sylvolysis now that's really quite a, an interesting title and you've been what is he talking about sylvolysis I'm talking about this now again I'm not sure with the lighting that you can see it very well but what you've got here is uh, a little chap um, 
sat in a market stall in Indonesia, India, or in fact anywhere in Asia, or Africa, or Latin America. And what this chap typically sells are these things, which we call sachets. And these are single dose um, shampoos, conditioners, or, or other products. And the reason they're single dose is because for many consumers, it's all they can afford. And if you go to Asia, you'll see they'll buy one, and they will probably use it four or five times for their family, okay? Because it is just all they have in the way of disposable income uh, for that particular day uh, or that particular week. Which is fine, but there is an issue with them, which is that the waste that's generated is, of course, extremely low value. And uh, again, most people will be familiar with in these sort of regions that there is a whole sort of um, uh, industry around collecting packaging waste and recycling it. It's, it's pretty wonderful. But of course, <coughs> If you're one of these guys who are sort of at the, towards the sort of lower end of, 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 of the income um, uh, uh, stream, um, you have a choice. Are you going to, for example, spend your day collecting um, PET bottles or Coke cans and therefore get a reasonable return? Or are you going to spend your day scratching around, gathering these things up, and even if you spent a day, you'd be lucky if you had enough of them to sort of, you know, fill. Uh, a bucket, yeah? and essentially the answer is obvious. So for us, it's about how do we create value in these what we call flexible, low value uh, materials to one day uh, get to the sta stage where people will start to recover them and bring them back into um, use uh, in, a, in a circular sense, okay? So this is the issue. Uh, we, we, we sort of, I think we're fairly familiar with this. Um, this is a, a landfill site in Indonesia. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you've had the sort of privilege of traveling to some of these regions, you'll, you'll know it's, a, it's an absolute uh, uh, nightmare. And, and to be honest, there's worse than this because you know, people, because of the lack of value, will just drop these things everywhere. And, and people use the phrase branded litter. It doesn't matter which company we're talking about, branded litter. So that's frankly undesirable, unhelpful, and if we think about the USLP, it's completely uh, against what we're trying to do in Union. So, what we've got is a program called Sorbolysis, which is trying to tackle it. And essentially, what you've got here is uh, a little sort of uh, life cycle that shows the current uh, way of uh, manufacturing these things. So you can see we start on the right hand side with a resin, we produce a film, obviously we convert it, it's distributed, it's converted into uh, these little sachets, and then of course the bad bit, which is disposal, and, and we've talked about the issue of litter. So what we've now done in collaboration with uh, the Fraunhofer Institute is developed a new technology which we call Zervolysis. And so what's happening now is we're taking that waste, we're basically shredding the material, and we're then processing this in order to get back to um, basically virgin PE resin, so that we can bring it back into uh, our products. And that is a process that we've now developed. I've got one more slide that sort of hopefully gives you a little bit more detail. You can see here that uh, essentially you've got the bales of, of material, that we're collecting from, from landfill sites. Um, we're sort of shredding that down. Then there's a whole dissolving process and drying process, and we come out with um, essentially polymer slurry that we convert into uh, resin, resin uh, pellets that can be then put back into our products. And the sort of hot off the press news is that this piece of technology, uh, this is the pilot facility that you're looking at here, uh, has now proven successful, and this is the sort of first hot off the press example of us reusing that material to create new um, flexible uh, bags. At the moment, we're only able to use it at a sort of 20% inclusion level because of the colour. It's a little bit of an off white colour, you may have seen that. Um, it doesn't sort of matter too much on these sort of products because it's a tri layer piece of packaging, so it goes in the middle layer. But the good news is that any material that we can't use 
It goes into many, many other applications such as pallets, such as furniture, such as, uh, well, basically plastic products that you're not really bothered about the appearance of. And so therefore we, we you know, we're very happy that we're creating that sort of stream that's sort of recovered and going back into alternative products. And really, the point here is that we're now starting to create value from waste. So that the next step is then we go back to uh, local authorities uh, and start to establish uh, collection schemes <coughs> whereby we can recover that material because people will get uh, a, a revenue uh, as a result of collecting it and therefore we start this sort of cycle circular process. Okay? So this is just one area that I wanted to share with you. Um, hopefully you'll see that uh, it's uh, very much around what we called earlier game-changing technology because this is extremely difficult to do and we have to make sure we don't solve one problem but create another one. But the hot news, as I've said, is it's happening, we're doing it, we're now marketing um, our products in Indonesia at this time we speak where we have uh, that material included. Okay? So, I think we're not too far away from um, my uh, time. And uh, I think that then leads us to uh, opportunities for any Q&A on any of the uh, case studies on Unilever Sustainable Living Plan or anything else you might want to ask me. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, sir. Um, indeed, who would like to ask? If you could say your name and where you're from, and then... <coughs> My name's Chris, I'm from Zenifier. Um, the question is really resolving energy with both products that are compressed and is one. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you didn't really mention how much energy is used to, to do those processes. No. Um, I wondered how much energy compared to the original it takes to compress the, the gases in the, and with the with the other problem, how much energy it takes to, you know, recycle the, the material itself if you could be <coughs> creating one yeah. problem with another. There you go. I mean, I, at this point in time, can't sort of say to you, Chris, this is the amount of energy used in terms of comparison of one process to another. However, what I can say is that the, um, the, 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 the USLP requires us to measure end-to-end -end every um, um, impact we make in our products, whether it be from the packaging materials, uh, the conversion process in our suppliers, the conversion process in our factory, and the whole distribution cycle. So what it means is that when we're evaluating these technologies, if we, um, uh, for a moment, uh, find ourselves getting excited about reducing, for example, the amount of packaging, and yet we've uh, doubled the amount of energy, then very quickly, when we sort of put it into this very sophisticated piece of software we use to sort of calculate the, the impact, it says, eh, eh, not a good thing to do, yeah? So it has to be net-net um, a, a benefit, and it has to be moving forward towards um, the 50% reduction, yeah? So that's, you know, what I can say at this point in time um, in terms of, you know, the way we look at it, yeah? Any more questions? Who'd like to go? Jackson at the back there, then. Hi, my name is Merlin. I'm from Wonder Stuff Studio. Hi, Merlin. Um, my question is just about how much of a, a kind of business case do you make? So, for example, compressing the packaging, like the, the investment in the technology yeah. affecting the unit cost and how that plays into the equation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I mean, first of all, I think what I would say is that. Ideally, we're looking for um, a business case that not only delivers some of the benefits that we've been talking about in terms of sustainability, but also delivers benefits in terms of growing unit. Remember that chart at the beginning where we said we want to double the business and, and, and essentially half our impact. So that's, that's the sort of principle. So I think the compressed one is, is, a, is a great example of where um, we, we were confident that we could land a, um, a more efficient product from a sustainability point of view. 
And then, but in terms of the investment needed in the technology and the change in manufacturing processes, um, that has paid back um, handsomely by actually the growth that we've seen in, in that particular um, uh, product as a consequence of consumers saying, I just love this, it's just much better for me, it's much more convenient. And remember, we talked about the retailer also being very positive because it increases the profitability in the retail market. So it, it's what I might call a sort of win-win situation. Now, not every case um, presents a win-win, and that then uh, is tricky for us because actually if by taking a more sustainable route, um, we obviously undermine the business case, then that's not sort of good for you, and, and, and okay, we might, we might sort of half the impact, but you know, the growth doesn't come. So in every innovation, we ask ourselves the question, can we marry a sustainability benefit with growing the business? And if you can get both of those coming together, then that's a massive benefit. There's another example which I didn't talk about, but you will notice when we talked about USLP, um, there's a whole uh, agenda around water. And um, again, if you look on the Union website, you'll see an incredible number of campaigns around water usage, um, you know, water purification, particularly in Asia again. And, um, and you know, these technologies are, are really tricky to bring to life. However, they also give you a growth opportunity. So I think that's, you know, that's the sort of philosophy that we're, we're really talking about here. Can we, can we do good um, for, for, for the planet, but also can we grow the business? It's not, it's not you know, we're not a charity, you know, we're here to make money. Uh, and we try to marry those two things together. So that's really the, the approach, yeah? There's, there's someone the one at the back, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, it's Matt Leavesley from Northumbria University. Uh -huh. um, I'm thinking in terms of the growth of the business as a result of the innovation that you're putting in. Yes. Um, do you think that it is an element of being distinctive in a crowded marketplace in those deodorants that suddenly you look absolutely different on the shelf? Is that what's giving you the growth? Or how, do, you, do you kind of understand what, is, is it belief in the sustainability message or is it simply kind of the kind of instinctive response of consumers in, in the moment of no, I mean, choosing? I, I think that there are, a, there is a consumer segment who, who are you know, attracted by the sustainability uh, side of things. But, but honestly, and certainly in Western Europe, most countries, they are in the minority. Our, our philosophy was, was based on the fact that we are the market leader in deodorants by a long way, okay? And we said that, uh, and this goes back to probably, I think it was 2010, 2011, we said, um, look, we think we can transform this market, okay? Um, actually, we tried before and, and not been successful, and other uh, organizations um, have tried before um, and not been successful, but we said, we think with our marketing uh, ability, we can transform this market. So I remember that at the beginning of the project, um, you know, the, we, we got the various groups together. You know, the technical <coughs> guys worked for me. They said, you know, we think we can crack the technology. But honestly, most of the emphasis went on to the marketeers. And it was, guys, how are you gonna sell this? How are you gonna, how are you gonna make sure that consumers don't see this as a, as a con and see this as a benefit? Uh, and what you'll see is that the, basically, the, the marketing starts with the um, brand um, brand sort of message. So we sh we looked at the Dove ad. Um, if I showed you, for example, the Shore ad, it would have a very different uh, a theme. Uh, Dove is all about skincare and, 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 and appropriate protection, and it's women targeted. Um, whereas the sort of Shore theme is all about you know, action and climbing mountains and jumping out of airplanes and things. And the whole, the whole sort of brand ethos is different. But then you weave into that the, um, oh, and by the way, this compressed um, format also is good for the planet. Yeah? But it's like a, oh, and by the way. Yeah? It's, and, and therefore, you know, we're successful because we are um, marketing great brands and you get something else. 
I think there's one other point to make here uh, on, on the theme, which is because people say, you know, why would, why would Unilever bother uh, to put all this effort into, um, into the USLP and, and projects like this? Um, because it, it does take a lot of, of resource and a lot of money. One thing that we see increasingly, by the way, is that um, uh, young people, and as many of young people in the audience, when they're making choices about the employer that they want to uh, 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 approach for, for uh, uh, employment, they are very much attracted by um, you know, Unilever's Compass Agenda and the USLP. They see that as something that you know, you know, has a meaning, has a purpose, and is something they want to be part of. Um, so interestingly enough, we tend to attract some of the very, very best talent. If you go on the sort of LinkedIn sort of employer survey, I think we, 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 we come after Apple um, and maybe Google, but I think we're number three, if I'm not, not mistaken. And coming back to your question, what's great about that is you're attracting people into the business who are excited about marketing this message and for technical people, excited about finding technology to land some of those um, benefits. And for designers, uh, excited about designing things that are going to make a difference. Remember I said, not just to Unilever's footprint, but to the handprint globally. So that's essentially the, the sort of virtuous circle. Um, uh, so, you know, like I said to, to the previous questioner, you know, we're not here just to sort of, um, to, to sort of you know, save the world. We're here to be a very successful organization, and as a consequence, through the USLP, help uh, make a difference. Thanks, Paul. Um, we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Yes. Uh, good morning, my name's Neil, and I'm here with Peace Innovation. Um, in my experience, um, the propellant in a can tends to last longer than the actual product. Okay. So there may only be a small amount of propellant left per can, but there's an awful lot of cans. Do you feel there's any benefit in making additional savings there in terms of energy propellant? <coughs> okay, um, so first thing to say is there shouldn't be <coughs> anything left at the end. Um, you might be like many guys, which is perhaps not read the instructions before you use it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so, so the big tip for this morning is if you shake it before you use it, then you should get um, Perfect, um, uh, compar perfect blend of, of propellant and, um, and product. However, uh, joking apart, um, even, even though if you use it properly, you, uh, you, you, you get to the end of the pack life, we're still conscious that we could do a lot better around uh, the recycling aspects of, of cans. Uh, and there's a big technology program that I can't say too much about at the moment which is all about how can we improve can recovery and recycling. Because, I mean, you will, depending on where you come from in the country, you'll be aware that um, some authorities uh, promote the recovery and recycling of, 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 of aerosols, and some others don't. And we've got a big campaign to try and get to a point where all authorities um, would uh, encourage the recovery of uh, aluminium cans. And one day, even recover aluminium aerosol cans in the same way that you would do in beverage cans. Yeah? So, so we're aware of it. It's absolutely uh, aligned with my point that it's a good piece of innovation, but it's only halfway to the end point. So, you know, ideas are, are very much welcome. Yeah? But it shouldn't, you shouldn't be left with um, propellers. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like the IKEA challenge. You need to read the instructions before you assemble the wardrobe. Yeah? That's, probably, <laughs> that's probably your biggest challenge, is we'll get men to read the instructions. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably this. Uh, Alan Curran, Park, Dominic Under. Uh, quick one, firstly, uh, both the cans, the, uh, the live ones and compressible and retail, are at the same price? Yes. Would, why wouldn't you um, retail the compressed ones at maybe a slightly lower price to sort of attract the people that are maybe apprehensive about yeah, so at the outset, there was, there was a lot of promotion, yeah, um, <coughs> you know, the, the whole sort of buy one, get one free, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole campaign at the beginning to, to encourage people to, to, to try it. We also, you may have seen in the advert, went for this, if it doesn't last as long, you get your money back. So that was a massive thing. Um, but at the end of the day, we didn't feel that 
On an ongoing <coughs> basis, we have to discount it because, um, well, firstly, we're giving the consumer the same benefit. Um, so why would we and why would the retailers um, have to take a, uh, a hit in terms of a discount? You know, and that's essentially their philosophy. Well, would they be taking a hit? Would they be saving money on the packaging? Yeah, there is. Yeah, there, there, there is a there is there is a small saving, but actually, what that is. Um, offset by is, is all of the costs associated with the R&D effort, the innovation, and also the quite significant um, promotional activity to, to convince people to sort of try it, yeah? So it all balances out at the end. That's, um, th that's, that's, the, that's basically the summary, I think. Tough question to finish on there. That was a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all we have time for, but Paul is going to be on all day? Yes. Yeah, I'll be at the end. I'll, sure. uh, I'll see you for lunch and finish, yeah? Good. Uh, Oh, that was, I don't know.